welcome to Decoded, Series 1, Episode 7, your weekly podcast providing in-depth insight into cybersecurity. Show notes including any links mentioned in the show are available at decodedcyber.com. I'm Simon Edwards, CEO and founder of SE Labs, the leading security testing lab. I've been advising on security for over 20 years. In this episode, we're going to look at what a computer breach, or hack, actually looks like, from both the attacker and defender's points of view. The IT security world is rocked by news of breach after breach, including the shocking disclosure of the SolarWinds attack. Data is stolen, deleted, or corrupted, and, well, you know, it's a total mess. Journalists focus on basic outcomes, while technical blogs look at esoteric technical details. We're going to look at what a breach looks like from an attacker's point of view and from the position of the defenders. We'll be talking about things that journalists never cover, examine some areas that even people in the industry don't like to talk about, but you won't have to dust off your hex editor, it's not going to be super technical. If you are a CISO, a CTO, or even someone who cares about their personal security, we have you covered. Well, let's start with how popular media portrays a hack. Thanks to Hollywood, in the public imagination, an attacker will work to break into a system, tirelessly or casually. But either way, the end result will be a successful hack. This will likely look like some green text on a black background saying, access granted, or similar. Flashing green text is optional. At that stage, the game is up and New York's traffic lights bank vaults and half the oil tankers in the world, will be under the evil genius's control. Where's Bruce Willis when you need him? Now, if the defenders are lucky, a firewall will detect the attempt. A flashing red light will then announce a breach or intrusion, and remediating this usually requires some rapid typing on one or more keyboards, or pulling some plugs. Sparks are optional. This is not what a breach looks like in the real world. Before we explore what a breach looks like to a defender, let's briefly look from the attacker's side. The first stages of a breach are likely to be an unauthorised login using credentials like usernames and passwords, or a more technical attack using exploits that provide the attacker with a level of access. Attackers like to use known stolen credentials because doing so is much less likely to trigger alerts from intrusion detection measures. After the very initial stages of the breach, an attacker will then interact with the compromised target either manually or using automated tools. This interaction may include installing malware, running commands built into the compromised system, such as PowerShell, that's, that's known as living off the land, uh, or using the system as a hop-off point to log into other systems. Running malware creates a higher risk of detection, but there are many ways to evade detection. Credentials are generally valuable, so unless the attacker is being very focused and already has access to what they need, it is likely they will harvest usernames and passwords from one or more systems on the network as they work their way through. This activity will often involve running tools to either extract the passwords directly or gather enough information to allow offline cracking. At this stage, the attacker can take steps to ensure they retain access to the network steal files immediately, install software that continues to steal information, damage data, and even misconfigure systems on the network, such as production machinery, or even other security systems like firewalls. They might also hide malware on systems ready to use later. You can actually hide malware on printers. Printers are just another kind of computer. So how does all this look to a defender who doesn't exactly know what attackers are doing every minute of the day? It's tough. To get a rounded perspective on what a successful attack looks like from the defence side, we spoke to Sinjin Harold, a veteran of cyber security. So Sinj, you've, you've worked in the forces, you've worked with the government, and you've worked with commercial organisations. Um, so you must have seen attacks or types of attacks that cover pretty much the full range. I have seen the attacks, uh, certainly watching them grow in sophistication and 
as and, and watching them move up the stack as well. And what I mean by the stack is starting at 20 years ago, was starting with a network layer uh, where, where the, the network was not as secure as they are today. Uh, and then watching them move up the stack towards the application layer. And, and now you're seeing a lot of attacks uh, which are occurring because of uh, poor software development or in incorrect implementations of software development and configurations. That's interesting and not to drift too much off topic, but um, the IETF, you know, the people who come up with the, the protocols that run the internet, um, we work with them a bit and there is an assumption from their side that the endpoint is handled and that the endpoints are secure and they don't need to worry about that. And from their perspective, that's, that's a fair assumption. Uh, and, and that's where a role like myself as, as a, a, a risk management uh, professional, it is my responsibility on behalf of an organization to make sure that those endpoints are secured uh, and implementing the, uh, the IETF requirements as appropriate. So you've seen from the old days, you've seen people hammering away at firewalls, for example, and now you're yeah. seeing things moving towards attacking the applications running on servers. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yep. And of course, with the age of cloud and that hybrid and SaaS style implementations, of course, we have to now take into account that, that, that shared responsibility as to, as to who is responsible for maintaining the security of those different layers. Hmm. I'm sure we'll come on to that later. Well, maybe, yes. So we, we know what an, a breach looks like. You just have to watch Die Hard 4 or whatever, or The Matrix to know <laughs> how computers are attacked. But in real life, what does a breach actually look like? I would suppose, I would say the most common breaches at the moment are still the, at the email phishing sort of uh, level. So that's where people are sending suspicious or, or uh, malicious emails to the end user and the end user will see that email as, as perhaps uh, coming from someone they would expect it to come from and, and, and don't pay too much attention. Mm -hmm. So social engineering is, is still very key to this. Very, very, very key. Probably, in my experience, is probably about 80% of all the, all the problems that occur at the moment. Mm -hmm. So the, those phishing emails are coming in. They are the attackers attempting to gain some sort of foothold in an organization. They're trying to take on a persona that is a legitimate persona within that organization. Mm -hmm. So we, we test email security gateways, for example, and they're not terribly good generally at stopping that kind of thing. So how do you combat the issue? There are probably a multitude of ways or a multitude of tools uh, that exist to try and provide controls that will uh, mitigate the, the phishing attacks or the social engineering attacks more broadly. Mm -hmm. And they will range from technical controls, which would be a, you know, the email gateways that you were mentioning, uh, right through to the user training and, and situational awareness training, and trying to get the end user to be a little bit more suspicious of emails that's come in and look for some hints of telltale signs that might suggest that this email is not as legitimate as it appears. Mm -hmm. So that could be a spelling mistake, or it could be the URL part of an email address. That's probably not the correct term, but the, <laughs> the, the, the domain part of the URL, is it coming from the location where you expect it to come from, or, or, is, it a, or, or is it coming from something else? So th th there are certain key things to look for, which you can then educate the end user to start to look for. And hopefully that will start to reduce the impact of, of uh, these uh, social engineering attacks. Okay, so moving further down the chain of attack, you've got people sending phishing emails in order to start attempting to breach an organization. Let's say that, that they succeed. Let's say that a user doesn't realize and clicks on the, on the thing. At that stage, is it detectable by the organization? Uh, sometimes. Depending on how you've configured your, your, uh, uh, your, your security tools. So what we have seen is, is, is someone clicks on an email, enters in credentials mistakenly, and the systems then start to detect that a multitude of emails are being sent from that account. 
more essentially more social engineering mm -hmm. email attacks but as part of the second stage of that attack and if the tools are correctly configured to to start to look for a particular threshold of emails being produced or issue, or emails being sent out like that the, the the gateway can actually block them from going externally if and, and if you've got it configured correctly internally you can also have it stopping internally mm. so that that's that's one potential way of of, of trying to stop those attacks but it, but it is hard it's interesting that you mentioned credentials because you know according to many of the the usual threat reports that we all consume on an annual basis stolen credentials make up a large part of an attacker's method of, of getting in and moving through systems so from a from a SOC point of view how can you s detect when attackers are using stolen credentials versus legitimate users just doing their work that's very hard. <laughs> hmm. Which is probably why uh, the bad guys are doing it. Yes, and, and, and of course, it's uh, very hard to detect when a legitimate account is being used maliciously. Hmm. And that's where sort of, the, the, sort of the modern technologies using artificial intelligence or behavioral analysis can start to play a role. And, and, and it's not just artificial intelligence, it, it, it's, it's also just looking for anomalous activity where you're seeing a, 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 a user who's logging on from a normal location. Mm -hmm. And five minutes later, you see that same account being used from a very different location, maybe, maybe from a different country. Mm. And that will indicate, potentially indicate that something might not be right. And, and so you're, you're so. Sort of, the, the likes of the of, of the big organisations, uh, which are, which are providing these these mail services, will be looking for that type of uh, access, and and will alert you if a particular threshold is is crossed. You've obviously got experience in AI, and it just occurs to me, and it's bothered me for a while now, that when when people use machine learning or AI to try and solve problems, is is it always the case that we're looking at? Say we're looking at credentials being used or, or behaviour of users. Is it being used to filter out the majority of the problems, or is it good enough to spot every single bad thing without any false positives? There's two types of machine learning technology uh, that I've used, uh, which is around the sort of the classification approach or around the anomalous detection approach. So the classification approach is all around trying to identify if a particular event fits within a bucket of, of known or, or very similar patterns, uh, which may or may not indicate malicious behavior or normal behavior. But uh, by, by trying to identify how they, um, how they fit within that category using what, what, what is known as supervised uh, machine learning, uh, you're, you're able to sort of have a, have a very good guess at whether it is a, a malicious event or not. The problem there is that you're controlled in your ability to detect all types of attacks by your training data. And, and, and that training data can provide a bias in, in one direction, depending on where you've collected that data from, or it can be very limited in its uh, sort of reach. Uh, or coverage of, of, of the types of attacks that you're looking for. And it's quite intensive in trying to get a good set of training data in order to, 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 to provide the coverage that, that you would need. And so an attacker will, will all, uh, a, a good, sophisticated attacker will always be trying to find the, 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 the range that that classification uh, system is working within and then try to push the boundaries and go outside of that classification mm -hmm. system. Whereas with the sort of the, the, the anomalous uh, the analysis, that's where you're trying to look for patterns which are not normal. But if a system has already been infected and malicious traffic is in there and then you come in afterwards and then try and set up some uh, behavioral analysis, that malicious traffic will be deemed normal. Yeah, yeah. If you've got a fully compromised network, then normal is is bad, but it's normal. And 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 so that will you're 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 now struggling to try and detect it using using that type of technology. They are very good, but they have a place, and they they cannot be used in isolation of of all of all the other existing 
security requirements, uh, you know, security hygiene, mm-hmm. uh, that defense in depth approach. But they, they are they are a good tool to start to help. I was talking to one of your colleagues from a, a four letter agency that we're both very familiar with, and he's a he was a pen tester. And he was called into an engagement where the company or the organization that was compromised was riddled. It was it was fully compromised and always had been pretty much as far as they could tell. And whenever they cleaned it out, it became compromised again. And their theory was that the opponents were using it as a training ground for their attackers rather than there being any assets that they wanted to steal or, or damage. Yeah, uh, what, what, what a better way. To, to find a, a uh, probably a probably a low profile organization uh, that that would not think that they would be high on the threat on the sort of on that threat target or possibly one that they knew would never be able to say anything about the breaches well that is that as well i mean there's just there's so many scenarios that, that you can think of either way no it, it, it's a uh, cat and mouse yes it's a cold war running on the computer systems. Again. <laughs> so <clears throat> there are different ways, obviously, of detecting breaches, and I'm sure every AI-based um, service available has got a dashboard that they would say would, would help you. But they, you can get a lot of alerts, can't you? Uh, you, you can be swamped by alerts. And, and that, over the sort of the last five, ten years, that has been a common issue with SOCs security operating centers where they have just been inundated with events that need to be investigated. And a lot of those events are false positives. They're, they're, they're legitimate traffic. And that's when uh, sort of that, that machine learning can help you mm. in, in weeding out those false positives because it learns what a false positive is. But that does mean that a false false negative could slip through, and and, and uh, you, you you don't detect a malicious attack when it is a malicious. Again, that's that's a scenario that nobody really thought. Very few people openly talk about. Yes, and also um, some products really don't help the situation because let's say you have a ransomware infection on a computer on the network, you'll often get multiple alerts on the same thing. So that that wall of alerts that you're facing, maybe quite a few of those um, will be false positives, but sometimes there'll be duplicates as well. Yep. And, and if, if, if an analyst is, is, is looking at each one manually, they may not even notice that it's a correlate, there, there's a correlation there. Hmm. And, and just see one alert, say, oh, that's a false positive, and see something that looks like it and just tick them all off as false positives, but actually, there's a correlation there going on and it might be because of something else going on in the background. Yeah, you can select all and delete, but then you've lost maybe some significant information. Yeah, just, just because it looks like all the others. So given, given, let's define a breach as, as a successful attack where something bad has happened, like you know, information yeah. has been stolen or, or something's been damaged. In your experience, how, when does that get noticed and how? Sometimes it gets noticed straight away. Sometimes it could be weeks or months later. Reading about it on the register. There's, there's I, I've, I've used that as a, as a, as a, a, a training example. I, I have seen that in practice as well. What should an organisation do when they see that they've been breached in the press? Well, I would probably take a step further back from the from the fact that a breach has occurred. I'd start with the government, and the government is, is, is a very a uh, very important part of, of making sure you know how to deal with a situation when, when it occurs. So the, the, a, a good governance structure, such as uh, the, the ISO 27035 or the NIST uh, standards, they, they provide a framework upon which an organization should consider implementing a, 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 a structure to deal with potential and actual incidents. Mm-hmm. So the first part is having your, 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 your first responders, which could be a service desk, or it could be the security analyst on the security team, or it could be the SOC. There's a whole route or a whole host of different first responders which need to sort of be made aware that when they're dealing with technical events, 
they need to have in the back of their mind that this this may actually be more than an event. It could be malicious. It could mm. be a breach. And so there, you, you you need to train them. Then you need to have the ability to to, to be able to quickly pull together an instant response team. And it's that instant response team that should have the uh, the skill sets to look at events that are being erased by the first responder to determine if it is actually a breach. And if it is a breach, then they need to have a, an established escalation path and an ability to classify the level of that breach. And by, by classifying the level of the breach, they then know what the escalation approach will be, whether it's to, to top management, to senior management, or, or whether they can actually resolve it there and then. Let's say you've been breached and you realize that you're part of a bigger problem. So I'm thinking of, of solo wins specifically, but I'm sure it happens in other cases. Do you, as an organization, do you just deal with it solely as a unit or do you have to think about others as well? The, f- the first thing is you need to understand what the breach is. You need to work out what data have I lost or what compromise has occurred or what, what is the impact of this breach and who has been affected. Mm. And when you start to pull those pieces together and you have access to perhaps a wider community out there where you can informally or collectively check the house rules, be able to talk about what you're seeing, you might be able to pick up that other people uh, are, are, are detecting that as well. Actually, that's where a cert comes in. So if, 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 if you can become part of a cert or you're all, if you're an organization that's big enough to have its own cert, uh, then that would be the focal point of being able to correlate to all the different breaches that are going on. Can you explain what a cert is? Uh, it, 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 it's a um, computer emergency response team. So a cert is a, I, I'll answer your question. Now. <laughs> so a, 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 a cert is a, a basically a compu- computer emergency response team, which can either be dedicated to one organization or be dedicated to an industry or a sector. Uh, and uh, they could also be part of a, a what, what they call a CSERT, which is a computer security incident of response team. And that is where the security side, the security analysts and the, and, and the security managers, they're, they're, they, they can start to uh, formalize the framework around how, how incidents are to be dealt with. And that's where you can start to see if there is a sort of correlations between other organizations that could have been infected or, or affected by the same same attack. How big an organization would you need to be to have one of those, do you think? You need to be able to be an organization that either sees that the risks that it could experience necessitates having a cert, or you're a global organization, or you could actually set up a cert for, a, for as I said, for a sector or an industry, and then those sort of like-minded organizations could then join together. So the UK government will have its own cert. The US will have its own cert. Uh, in, in fact, it's a mandatory requirement for all EU countries uh, to have a cert. So the, the, the UK has the National Cyber Security Center, uh, and that is where they provide that sort of overarching security organization and for incident response for, for government departments. Uh, you were talking earlier about how you've seen the attacks moving kind of up the up the stack, if you like, so starting at the network level and, and moving through. And there is an assumption that endpoints are, are sorted out, they're fine, they're locked down, which you know I don't think is true. Um, but if, if that is true, does that mean that antivirus is dead now? We don't have to worry about that kind of thing. No, because a an attacker will always try try to use the path of least resistance to get to their end goal, uh, define depending on what their motivation is for doing the attack. And if they discover that an endpoint can be compromised through a very basic malware attack, because the AD solution isn't installed or turned on mm. then why are they going to try and do something sophisticated when they could do something very simple i think that's a really interesting point as well that when you respond to a breach what we see generally in public responses 
is a claim that the attacker was sophisticated or advanced. But it's not always the case, is it? I would say the effort to do a really sophisticated attack is very intensive, has to be very well planned, has to be executed with with such efficiency and, and, and control that the effort and the opportunity cost of delivering it can be very uh, unrewarding unless the target is exceptionally high profile. Mm-hmm. And I would suggest the majority of attacks are quite easily detectable if you have a full defense in depth approach to, to, to delivering security. And the volume of attacks, you know, you, you mentioned phishing earlier. You, people can recruit other people and just send a deluge of, of phishing attacks from all sorts of places. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it's, it's that one to many. Get, get a foothold with one, they, they, they can then send out to their to their list. And essentially, that's a trusted email that's coming out. Because it is it is a legitimate email in, in as much as it's coming from a legitimate user. The problem is it has a malicious payload that the user didn't know it was sending. So when 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 you're on that second stage attack and you're going out to a wider audience and it appears to come from a trusted user, and it to be fair, it, it does look like it's coming from a trusted user because it is actually. Um, you're 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 likely to become more susceptible to falling for it. Intent is a really hard thing to prove. I mean, in in the physical world, if I, if I go out, if I come around to your house, you've got a problem with your electrics, and I bring a screwdriver with me. My intent is to use this sharp piece of metal to fix a problem. But if I'm a bad guy and I then see an opportunity to to use that tool to hurt somebody, um, it suddenly turned into a weapon. And similarly, you can set up websites and, and internet accounts with the intention of doing one thing, say to play a joke on you, for example, um, and then it causes damage. It's really hard for people and for technology to distinguish the difference between intent when the binary bits are all the same. Yeah, no, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, uh, so it's intent and, and it's, a, it's a sort of accountability, I, identifying who was behind the attack as well. So uh, quite quite often they they they, they will be u- using deniable techniques to look like someone else, and therefore because you don't know the origin, you don't know the motivation, and therefore you can't assess the attempt. Th- this has come up a bit um, in the in the technical discussions online recently, where there have been some breaches, and people have been attributing them to certain nation states, and others are pointing out that. There's nothing to stop a nation state, uh, let's say the Russians, um, employing a penetration testing organization, a shady one, albeit, in another country and getting them to do the work. And then all those flags, the, the working hours, the, the code and the malware, all the rest of it, um, doesn't mean anything. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, 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 that reminds me of, I forget the name of the company, but the, the, there was an Indian security company that had a pen testing team that was doing exactly that. It, it was both white and black in terms of hats. Well, so they were a legit, in some respects, pen testing company, but they were doing yeah. dodgy engagements. Yeah. Uh, they were cowboys for hire as well. This is Beltrox we're talking about. And, and that goes back to the intent. So on, on one hand, you think you've hired someone who's... Uh, you think you've hired someone who is uh, uh, trying to do the right thing and, and, and provide a service to help you and in fact, then they're, they're using that service that they're trying to help you with to find back doors so that they can then attack you later. I suppose there's even a potential that some of the employees wouldn't know that they were doing bad work. It's just hacking, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's just trying to find a weakness. And, uh, you, you find that weakness and you report on it. But if you've got such an organisation where you have to, where there's a hierarchy, and, and you find the attack, and then you report that up for someone else to write up, you, you don't know if they're going to fully write it up or, 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 or use it for, for uh, malicious purposes. There are many ways that attackers can gain access to a target network, but that initial access of a system is the beginning of an attacker's journey. It's just one of many opportunities 
for defenders to detect and repel the breach. In fact, a breach is a successful attack that achieves an attacker's goals, usually of data theft or destruction. Gaining access, if only impotently, might not count, even though it's not ideal. Endpoint detection and response products vary in their design, but their general purpose is to track incoming threats and to allow defence teams to fix issues as and when they occur. The act of looking through logs and other data to find successful attacks is called threat hunting. This gives one view on what a breach looks like. Ideally, this would be an easy task, with only the most important details and clear calls to action being available to busy IT staff. The truth is far from this, and security companies are racing to produce good ways to triage cyber attacks. Threat hunters may start their work with an EDR dashboard, but usually have to use additional detective work to get enough information together to execute an effective mitigation. For now, Threat hunters generally have access to a dashboard that gives an overview of incidents on the network. The dashboard will often list each suspicious activity individually. And sometimes one attack can generate multiple detections of the same or similar actions. For example, installing ransomware should be one line in a list of detections, but in reality it can be detected multiple times. This can be a right pain. EDR products can differ in a number of ways. They might be more or less capable of detecting threats. They might present that information in more or less useful ways. And they might provide varying levels of useful actions, uh, possibly including the ability to freeze affected systems, placing them into a sort of virtual quarantine. A good EDR solution makes detecting and remediating a breach easy. A poor one will not provide enough information or could even be misleading. There's also the issue of alert fatigue, where multiple alerts represent a single attack. Administrators of the dashboard struggle to collate all of the alerts for one attack while trying to ensure they don't miss anything else important that can hide in plain sight in the general noise generated by the detection tools. Sometimes what looks like an alert is just a record of valid system behaviour and sometimes an EDR dash will get things completely wrong. So how do you choose from the multitude of products and services available? We've already seen in the previous episode how buying a good security product can be nearly as hard as keeping the bad guys out. I quite like to finish by saying, you know, asking a question along the lines of, you know, what can people do to be better prepared? But I think you've already said quite a lot of that. Um, and, but without being specific... What kinds of products or and or services do you think um, established large organisations might consider, or even very new startup ones without the budget? Really, what I would say is you need to understand your risks first before you start to go out there and buy the tools to mitigate those risks. Because if you're just buying the tools because everyone bought them, you may not actually have that risk, and it could be a redundant tool. I, I would always say, understand what your risks are. And, and for larger organizations, it's, it's been shown that as you become more high profile, so you become a higher target. And therefore, you have to have a stronger, a layered defense in depth approach to your security. And it's not just about tools, but it, it's, it's about culture. It's, it's about uh, putting in place a, a a security and let's not forget the privacy aspects as well, but a security and privacy organization which has assessed where the risks lie and then put appropriate controls in place. And one of those controls could be could, could just be security awareness training. Does it always involve a drop in convenience? No. No, so, so, sometimes it can actually uh, in, improve convenience. Now, obviously, things like uh, implementing MFA. Does, does feel like it's um, an inconvenience, but that's possibly due to the fact that you're, that over the years, we've been used to just using a, a username and password, and that password has been very similar across all the accounts you've been using. Well, multi-factor authentication has become a lot easier to use in the last few years, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, 
some MFAs, which use biometrics, it's very easy to use. <laughs> Although I find that I find it harder to unlock my phone now I have to wear a face mask when I'm trying to buy something. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, the, um, the, there are apps now as well. And I remember in the old days of it, you would have to, the app would produce a code and then you'd have to type it in within 10, 15 seconds or whatever. But now the phones can just pop up and say, do you want to allow this, yes or no? Yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 that's, that's, so actually it's now becoming a lot easier to, to, to log in. So sometimes when I'm trying to log into a, a a, a website i find it easier now to do it from my phone than i do from the laptop mm. just just because it's all integrated into my thumbprint i mean even i'm thinking about office 365 um the multi-factor authentication system there it may be better now but five years ago it was really hard oh, just to painful. find the settings yeah painful but but they 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 really improved in leaps and bounds in, in their security sort of uh, offering hmm. over, over that period of time. As, as a native product, if you're, if you're using the native security tools, it's going to be okay for the majority of people. Given, you know, I'm thinking about Microsoft was involved in some respects with the SolarWinds business, um, and you've got this sense that there's an awful lot of compromising going on, and the services that we all rely on, um, they, they make us feel secure because they have MFA and all the rest of it. Do you think there's any sense in assuming some level of compromise with everything that we do online these days? Yeah. You, 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 you have to work on the assumption that you are about to be compromised or you are compromised, and you then have to start to think how you design architectures with that in mind. So that starts to sort of move towards the... the, the the, the encryption of data throughout its life cycle of how it's being used. So encryption at rest, encryption in transit, and, and, and encryption when being accessed via uh, sort of third parties. I went um, into an organisation once um, and asked a question. I said, do you think you're compromised or haven't been compromised? You know, what, what do you think? And there were three individuals there. One was the IT manager. He was ex-Royal Navy and therefore... Let's just say he was very confident, and he said, "He said, no, we, we, we're not compromised, and we never have been." Um, and his his subordinate said, "Well, I don't think we have been, but I, I can't be sure." And the chief financial officer it sounds like a joke, doesn't it? The CFO said, yeah. <laughs> "said um, I don't know, and does it matter?" I think fair point does it matter? well yeah I mean they were a media company so if someone's stolen some advertising that they're producing who cares it's, it's not life or death in that respect it's financial impact yes and so I actually I was shocked at the time but actually you know listening to you talking about assessing the risks he's probably thinking quite sensibly yeah which also means he's not going to put much money towards protecting the organization yes yeah yeah I, I, I always work on the assumption that you have been compromised. Now let's let's put the tools in place to, 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 to assume that compromise. And now let's try and find out where, where they are. But only I mean, you've got to take into account that actually sometimes it's okay that it's compromised because the information that you have is is publicly available. Mm. You know, and, and if it's if it's publicly available, but you're just processing it, and, and integrity isn't the issue. Then does it does it does it really matter? Well, let's think about personal privacy. So you know, um, BA gets breached, and all our email addresses and phone numbers end up everywhere. Well, I <laughs> during lockdown I was trying to get a bit fitter, and I used one of these fitness apps. I think it was called Strava, and oh, yeah. I logged into it using my email address, and it said, "Oh, um, you've got at least two friends on Strava. Do you want to um, kind of connect with them and, and monitor each other's performance?" And what that meant was these two inverted commas friends um, had joined Strava and clicked the button to upload their contacts to the service and share all of my personal data and yours and everybody else's with the company. And it made me cross, but it also made me think, well, do should we now consider our email addresses and personal mobile numbers 
as private or do we just assume that everybody's got it and and worry about how to handle that later i think it's the uh it's the ability to correlate all that information in a way that starts to reveal more information about you than you really wanted them to to be able to do the privacy is is, is you know, a lot of a lot of the privacy is around i just don't want that organization to know that or i don't want the users who are, who are part of that organization to know that i'm here yeah yeah so i mean in this case it's health and fitness but it might be something uh, more sensitive mightn't it well even even with with the health it, you know you're you're you're, you're showing you, you could share all sorts of information which you wouldn't want people to know you know weight hmm. uh, blood pressure, uh, temperature for the day. I, I don't know. I mean, there's so many things that you can collect about you. Uh, and when pulled all together, can reveal more than, than, the, than the sort of the individual elements. Yeah. And maybe even just from a personal security point of view, you know, when we think about um, resetting internet accounts, uh, which obviously might include banks and things as well, it's the mobile number and the email address that tend to be quite critical to that process. Yeah, especially if you're um, getting the, the multi-factor text alerts mm. or, or numbers in order to feed in, and and and, and the uh, the phone jacking, the, the SIM jacking, SIM swapping of the uh, of that phone number, and then they've got access to your bank account. Well, um, the journalist Brian Krebs recently covered this. Um, there's there's a, another way of doing it now that doesn't even require you to take someone's sim so you can use certain uh, voice over ip services and if i want to get your text messages singe um, apparently i can and all that you'll notice is you don't get text messages for 20 minutes 30 minutes um, and then service resumes for you uh, but meanwhile i've been collecting them myself yeah so i think my, my message to any friends and colleagues listening is please don't share your address books without getting the consent of everybody in your address book I, I, I agree with that, um, but it, it, that, that, that comes down to, again, educational awareness. Hmm. And the companies know what they're doing. They make it easy, don't they? They they don't say, give us all your friends' data. They say, oh, do you want to connect up with all your friends? And of course you do. And so that's when you press the button. No, absolutely. And the psychology of it, it, it is all about being connected, being being together. Yeah which is what makes us humans a successful kind of creature on this planet. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and yet, the, the bad guys can, can, can use that to their advantage. We might have a podcast about that earlier in the series. <laughs> <laughs> please subscribe. And if you enjoyed this episode, please send a link to just one of your close colleagues. If you want to join the Decoded community and access private content, including our monthly executive briefings, apply at decodedcyber.com slash circle. And that's it. Thank you for listening, and we hope to see you again soon.